Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you would be strangely gracious with us in sending your Son to put an end to the enmity that man has been at odds with you since Genesis chapter 3. It is right for your church and for the world to stop and recognize the incarnation of your Son. To realize, Lord, that in sending Christ to die for sinners like us, you will reconcile all things to yourself. So I ask, Lord, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would bless this church today with a greater understanding of your holiness, the sacrifice that Christ has made, and the obedience that you call us to as your children. That we would be rightly amazed at the Son of God becoming a man. That we would rightly treasure and ponder in our hearts this great work of Jesus coming to redeem sinners like us. And that we would, like the shepherds, glorify and praise your most holy name. I ask, Lord, that you would take a passage so well known to most of us and make it new. Bring a refreshment to it, Father, so we hear, maybe for the first time, the power and the majesty displayed in Jesus Christ. I praise you, Lord, for this time of year and this opportunity to look at Luke chapter 2. For those who have been raised in the church and have heard this story dozens of times, I ask, Father, that you would be gracious with them, that they might hear it and be encouraged. For those who are hearing it the first time, I pray, Lord, for that amazement and that awe and that wonder to bring transformation of heart and mind. And for those who are rejoicing, I pray you would cause us to rejoice even more. I ask, Lord, that you would bless the proclamation of this word from a sinner like me. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Good morning. You know, in Farsi, there's a saying that if you've heard the sultanis, they'll often say, Hastinabushi, and that means don't be tired. Um, they, that, that's what it literally means. They say it after, usually if you've done a lot of work. But I'm going to say it to you, Hastanabushid. Don't be tired, all right? So we've gathered here this morning on the Lord's Day to worship God and the incarnation of the Son. And so this should be a time of great excitement and great joy as you listen to this story proclaimed. Amen? All right, so Hastanabushid. On June 6, 1944... For those of you who did well in your U.S. history class, you remember that day, studying it at least. June 6, 1944, the Allied forces launched the greatest amphibious invasion in the history of the world, and they stormed the beaches of Normandy, France during World War II. The operation was called Operation Overlord. 156,000 Allied troops, 7,000 Marine vessels, including landing vehicles, and over 11,000 aircraft on that single day to try to take back Europe. 10,000 Allied troops were killed, wounded, or missing in action in that first 24 hours of the battle. 10,000. Last year, we celebrated the 75th anniversary of this historic day, also known as D-Day, which is how you probably know it. And we do so because D-Day is remembered by most as the beginning of the end of the war. In fact, 11 months later, On May 5th, 1945, Germany surrendered unconditionally to the Allied forces, ending the war in Europe. Now, as you gathered on Friday and celebrated Christmas on Christmas Day, you opened presents, I imagine, and enjoyed family or friends and hopefully some good food. But I imagine that most of you probably did not celebrate the day as the end of a war. And yet the coming of the Son of God in the flesh was just that. Not Operation Overlord, but Operation Christ the Lord. God the Father launching the greatest attack in human history on sin and death that the world has ever seen. Sending His own Son into the world as a man, not to ascend the cliffs at Normandy, but to ascend the cross at Calvary 
and put an end to the power and of sin and death forever. That's a big day. It's a big day, and therefore it's right for us as a church to remember it. The Gospel of Luke gives us some of the greatest details in the Bible surrounding the beginning of this invasion by God. In Luke chapter 1, we see the, the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and to Elizabeth and revealing the birth of John the Baptist and then of Christ himself. In chapter 1, we have Mary visiting Elizabeth and, of course, John the Baptist leaping in Elizabeth's womb and then Elizabeth being filled by the Holy Spirit, prophesying to Mary about this Son of God that is going to be in her. You have the birth of John the Baptist in Luke 1, and then you have Zechariah's great prophecy. Luke 1, 68, listen to what he says. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Speaking, of course, of the coming of Christ and this planned war on sin in order to set his people free. And then you make your way into the beginning of chapter 2 and you have a very brief description of the birth of Jesus Christ. Joseph and Mary, of course, are making their way from Nazareth and Galilee down to Bethlehem in Judea, the city of David, in order to register for the mandatory census issued by Caesar Augustus. Upon their arrival, this is what we're told. Luke chapter 2. The time came for Mary to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And so the nativity scene is set, and then as soon as Luke is finished describing that, he whisks the reader away out to some field, and a group of shepherds, on night watch over their sheep. And this is the scene. The shepherds getting word of Operation Christ the Lord having commenced that night. This is the scene that I would like us to listen to and hear how the shepherds heard God's word and see how they responded to it. And by God's grace this Christmas, we do the same. The central point of the sermon is simple. Christ came to make peace by going to war. Christ came to make peace between God and man by going to war against sin and death. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Oh, I love the family, and I love the food, and I love the gifts. I do. I like getting gifts, and I like giving gifts. But that's not the primary purpose of Christmas. It is the coming of the Son of God. So let's have a look this morning at this passage in three particular ways. One, I want to see the recipients of this peace that this Christ child brings. Number two, the glory of the peace. And number three, the effects of it. All right? Who gets it? Why is it so glorious? And what impact should it have on us, if any at all? Point number one, the recipients of peace. Look at, uh, look at verse eight in Luke two with me. Luke writes, and in the same region, that's, they were right in the same region as Bethlehem where Jesus was born. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, which was not uncommon. Night watches were required, lest the sheep be eaten by animals or stolen by thieves. And so they're out doing their job. And then we're told in verse 9, look with me, that an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now that's the same Shekinah glory that we've looked at several times in the Old Testament. It's the same glory that came down on Mount Sinai in Exodus 16. It's the same glory that filled the temple in 1 Kings 8. It is the glory of the Most High God. And we're told what? That they were filled with great fear. That's the right response. Now picture this. It's, it's nighttime. It's quiet. They're watching over their sheep. It's a silent night, and then what happens? A supernatural event. An angel of the Lord descends into their presence, and it's not just the angel, which would have been shocking enough. It's an angel who is surrounded by the glory of God. The glory of God fills the night sky, and they are terrified. I imagine the angels, he's talking, they're down, prostrate, on the ground, begging for mercy. And so the angel has to say to them, look at verse 10, the angel said to them, fear not. Don't be afraid. This is not a message of judgment or condemnation. It's a message of peace. It's a message of reconciliation. Fear not, the angel said. And listen, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. 
Verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. The good news of great joy is the gospel message. It is the long-awaited promise that God would send a Savior, His own Son, to become a man, a man, flesh and bone, just like us, to overcome the power of sin and death for sinners just like us. He would come to make for Himself a new race. He would establish a new king and a new kingdom. He would call his people to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation who would worship this new king forever and ever. This was the promise that God made all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Right after the war started, right after Adam and Eve sinned against God and initiated the conflict, God made this promise when he cursed Satan. Genesis 3.15, God said, He, Jesus, will crush your head, Satan, and you, Satan, will strike his heel. The striking of the heel took place on the cross. We know that. But the crushing of Satan and the power of sin and death took place on the cross also. The decisive victory in the war was won at Calvary. And the promise here is that every generation, from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Moses to David, they were waiting for the Savior to come, and he came. The prophets prophesied to it over and over. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name what? Emmanuel. God with us. The Son of God coming down. The good news of great joy is God dwelling with man, but not just to come and hang out with his creation, but to come and exercise a war to decisively and once and for all overcome the power of sin and death over those created in his image. What a message. What a message. Look at verse 11 again. The angel said, For unto you, speaking to the shepherds, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Great joy. Not just a personal satisfaction because circumstances are good but great joy in the arrival of the Savior to overcome the battle of sin and death. Great joy. It's the joy of a victorious king coming to save his people. It's the joy of a a groom coming to rescue his bride. It's the joy of the end of wars, all wars. The end of sin, the end of death, the end of suffering. God restoring his good creation. Christmas, my beloved, for the Christian is the spiritual D-Day. It's our spiritual D-Day where we can stop and we can remember and say 2,000 years ago, God went to extreme measures to buy back rebels like us. And so we rightly sing joy, joy, joy because that night, on that night in the city of David, Micah's prophecy had finally been fulfilled. Micah had prophesied You, O Bethlehem, Epaphra, you too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, God said, who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. You know how many passages in the Old Testament speak to Christ coming as a warrior, to be a ruler, to be a king, to exercise authority over his kingdom? The Savior of Israel, this Savior, was none other than the Ancient of Days, Christ the Lord. That word Christ, we equate it to Christ, Jesus Christ in the name, and that's not wrong, but it's a title. It means Messiah. It means the Anointed One. And so this Savior from the city of David, from the line of David, is the Messiah. It is the long-awaited superior king of the Davidic covenant. And then we're told he is also Lord. And that is, my beloved, listen, that is equating him to Yahweh. He is the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of David. He is God. So that's what the angels are declaring to these shepherds. It couldn't have been any more clear that night how they described Jesus Christ to these lowly shepherds. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that God is able to communicate 
the gospel message to even a group of uneducated shepherds like this. But we should be a bit surprised that he actually did. From a cultural standpoint, when we think of shepherds today, most of us think of, of David in, in 1 Kings, or 1 Samuel chapter 17, when he defeated Goliath, and we have this picture of the shepherd being a noble man, and they were actually more so when David was alive. Or we think of Jesus being the great shepherd. Or maybe for some of us, we think of those Christmas plays and the three-year-olds playing the shepherds, and they're wrapped up in their, their little cloaks, and they have their staffs, and they're so cute. Well, no one fancied being a shepherd in the first century. No one fancied. No father said, oh, I hope my daughter, when she's older, marries a shepherd. Shepherds in the first century had a reputation of being dishonest. They often would take their sheep onto property that was not their own and allow their sheep to graze there illegally. And because of their work, the type of work and the handle of the animals, they were considered unclean according to the laws of Moses. They had one of the lowest jobs and one of the lowliest occupations in their time. So why would God bring the message of Operation Christ the Lord to shepherds first? Why would the drama surrounding the birth of the Savior of the world, this execution of the greatest invasion against sin and death in the history of the world, why would God not include the secular and religious rulers of the land? Why didn't the angel appear to Caesar Augustus or to King Herod or the Sanhedrin? I mean, that seems more appropriate. Now, here's why. And this is good news for us. From the inception of the gospel of peace, God wanted the world to know that Jesus came to save sinners who understand that they cannot save themselves. From the beginning of the gospel, God wants the world to know that Jesus came to save sinners who know they cannot save themselves. Shepherds represented the lowly, outcast, marginalized people of their day. They had no power. They had no voice, nothing the culture admired, and yet the gospel of grace and peace was made available to them first. Strange. A few chapters later in Luke chapter 5, the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at Jesus. He's now engaged in his ministry as an adult. They were saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And then Jesus answered them, listen, He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And then he said in verse 32 of Luke 5, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now the great irony in Luke 5 is that no one is righteous, no, not one. No one seeks after God. All have sinned, we know, Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that means everyone needs to be saved from the sickness of sin. Everyone needs the doctor of Christ. The problem is not everyone thinks that they are sick. Not everyone believes that they need saving. The Pharisees and the scribes believed that they were, they were righteous because they were blood children of Abraham. They believed that they were righteous because they were adhering to, or so they thought, the laws of Moses and the laws that they brought made up themselves. Shepherds, on the other hand, they had no such false pretenses. Our shepherds, they knew they were unfit for any kingdom, let alone the kingdom of God. But that's the first step, my beloved, into being saved by grace through faith, is knowing that you are unfit. It's knowing that you're sinful through and through, and that it will require God to forgive you of your sins and make you holy to enter in. The gospel of peace cut through all the shepherds' preconceived ideas about salvation and righteousness and what it means to please God. The message that the angels gave to the shepherds that night reveals that no one, listen, no one has a claim on God. No one has a right to eternal life because of family name or education or your good works. But everyone, listen, everyone has a claim who Mark 10, 15 receives the kingdom, what? As a child. Everyone has a claim who receives as a child. The child has no claim. Having no claim to eternal life or peace with God, the child receives it freely like our shepherds by grace through faith in this newborn king. Our shepherds jump 
at the opportunity, rightfully so, to be led in, not by their own works, but by God's grace through faith in the Savior. So my friends, I ask you this morning, how have you received the peace offering made by God this Christmas season? How have you received it? Did you take it and have you received it as a Pharisee or as a shepherd? Deserving of God's favor because like the Pharisee, you think overall you've lived a pretty good life. You've been a good husband or a good wife. You've attended church faithfully. You read your Bible. You've created a work system that in your mind you think God is pleased with. That's a Pharisee. Or have you responded like the shepherds, seeing clearly that even your most righteous deeds are nothing but filthy rags before this holy God, that you have nothing on your own to offer? Your most righteous deeds before the holiness of God are nothing but trash. Shepherds understood that. Now the litmus test for such a question, I believe, is not asking you how you think. Because 99.9% of you say, oh, I'm the shepherd. I'm not the Pharisee. No one wants to be the Pharisee. But the answer to the question is not what you think, but how well you love. The answer is not what you think in terms of how you receive it, but how well you love God and how well you love others. A few chapters later in Luke chapter 7, our Lord is dining with Simon the Pharisee. Most of you know this encounter well. A prostitute comes in. She falls down at Jesus' feet and she worships him. She anoints his feet with her tears and with oils. When Simon the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, Now I want you to listen to the words of a man still at war with God. This man has not made peace with God. Listen to what he says. Simon the Pharisee said to himself, If this man, speaking of Christ, were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. You see what he did? He lifted himself up. He put her down and said, She's not worthy to be in the presence of this prophet. Jesus said this in response, listen with all your might. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Jesus asked Simon. Simon answered, well the one I suppose for for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. No doubt, lifting up Simon in his own eyes. But then Jesus said this. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, now listen. Therefore, Jesus said, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. A.K.A. Simon, your sins remain Forgiveness is not yours. You are still at war with God. How did he know that? Little to no love. What does the love, my beloved, or lack thereof in your life reveal about your understanding of the gospel of grace and your relationship with God through Christ? What does it reveal to you this morning? Have you responded to the gospel like a Pharisee or like a shepherd? Like Simon or like the prostitute, you will know, not by what you think, but by how you love. Your love for God and your love for one another. The angel of the Lord brought to the shepherds that night good news of great joy that will be for who? For all people. Shepherds, Israelites, Gentiles, tax collectors, prostitutes, lying, coveting, thieving sinners, just like us, the gospel is for. In other words, no one is excluded from the hope of the gospel of peace except, listen, those who exclude themselves. 
No one is excluded from this good news of great joy that came when Christ became a man, except those who refuse to repent of their sins and put their hope in operation Christ the Lord. John 17, you already heard it read once. John 3, 17. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is what? Is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. In other words, there's no other way of salvation. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit purposed to send Christ the Son to die for the sins of His people. If you reject the incarnate Son, if you refuse to repent and believe, there is no hope. There is no peace between you and God. There is only judgment and death. So first we see, I pray, that the gospel of peace is for everyone. But only those who know they're at war and understand that they cannot end the war and save themselves and turn to Christ can receive the peace that God the Father offers. Are you with me? All right, good. Can I go to another point? All right, so what makes this peace so glorious? You say, well, this peace is what brings me into a right relationship with God the Father. True. Point number two, the glory of peace. Look at verse 12 again. The glory of peace. And this will be a sign for you, the angel said to the shepherds. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Swaddling cloths were strips of clothes. We do that today. We swaddle our babies. We have blankets and we swaddle them up tight. They were actually strips of cloth. The question for the shepherds would be, how do we know this is an angel of the Lord? I mean, it's an extraordinary experience, right? But how do they know this message is accurate, that they weren't having some type of late-night group hallucination? Maybe they all had Taco Bell the night before or something. How would they know this was, in fact, the beginning of the end of the war and that the Messiah promised for centuries had actually come into their midst? Verse 12 tells us it is a sign And there are three things. One, there's going to be a baby. Two, that baby's going to be wrapped in swaddling cloths. And number three, very strange, the baby's going to be lying in a manger. Number one and number two, okay. Number three, odd. Certainly the only baby that night in Bethlehem that was sleeping in a manger. So in order to substantiate the angels' claims that Operation Christ the Lord had indeed commenced, they said, you got to go see the nativity scene you got to go see Joseph and Mary and the baby in the manger. Now, we've all seen the nativity scene. Granted, some historical inaccuracies with it, but that's okay. The essence is there, right? You usually have Mary and Joseph, you usually have a baby, and that baby's usually wrapped in something and lying in a manger. My parents had a nativity scene that I remember so well. It had a little light in the back, and it had a, a particular glow to it that would light up. It was a very small manger scene. And I remember lying in front of that every Christmas, hours on end, it seemed like trying to wrap my head around this thought that this baby was God. I struggled with that. This is what the angel had declared to Mary in Luke 1. This is what the angel was saying to the shepherds in Luke 2 that this baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in the manger was not just another savior that God was sending. This wasn't just another Noah or Moses or Samson or David. This is the final savior. This is, in fact, the son of God. It is God himself in the flesh. Now, you can't, my beloved, listen. If you're listening, you can't hear that go, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. No, it's not of course. It is absolutely true. But it is one of the most profound revelations given to God by man. God in the flesh. I'm not sure I have you on that. I still say, yeah, 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 okay. Just because you're raised in the church and you believe this your whole life does not make it less amazing. All right. The most extraordinary part of the Christmas story is the hardest part for people to believe. The most extraordinary part is that God became a man. And it's the hardest for us to believe. God becoming a man, listen, truly man, not partially man, and remaining at the same time truly God. Coming as a man to start a war as a baby, 
to begin with, as a baby, helpless. And I think about this for a minute. This, he was truly man and therefore a baby that needed food and warmth and protection. That's why he was wrapped in swaddling cloths, and that's why Mary was likely feeding him that night. And yet at the exact same time, this baby is the Word of God testified to in John chapter 1. The Word of God, the creator of all that is seen and unseen. So on that first Christmas night, Jesus is lying in the manger being nursed by Mary. And at the exact same time, this baby is holding, sustaining, and preserving the entire universe. Exact same time. Nursing and upholding. This truth is what we call the the hypostatic union, Jesus being truly man and truly God. It was revealed that night and it was revealed in his entire ministry. And even if you know the Gospels, you know that Jesus Christ lived and experienced full humanity. In the Gospels, we see Jesus hungry. We see him weary like a man. We see him tired. At the end of the Gospel accounts, we see him beaten. We see him bleed because he's a man. We see him suffer. We see him die. We see his body put into a grave like a man. Truly and fully man, Jesus Christ experienced all the trials and all the struggles that each and every one of us experience in this fallen creation. But as a man, he simultaneously proved himself to be the Son of God. As a man, he proved that. He said, well, how did he prove that? What did he do during his earthly ministry that people found so shocking? What did he do? He gave sight to the blind. He enabled the deaf to hear, the lame to walk. He healed leopards. He calmed storms. He cast out demons. He made dead people alive. He made himself alive. My beloved, those are all works of creation that only the Creator can do, that only God can do. Even the very process of him becoming a man was revelatory. The Holy Spirit descends upon Mary, who is a virgin, and somehow she is able to conceive. Why? Because it is God. Gabriel said to Mary, Luke 135, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, listen, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So even from the conception in the womb, the testimony of the man, the God-man is true. This was the radical, history-changing message brought to the shepherds that night by the angel. That the baby in the manger that they were told to go see was in fact God himself with all the power and all the authority under heaven worthy to be worshipped and praised. So glorious was this revelation, my beloved, that it was not sufficient for a single angel to speak it. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, we're told that suddenly, as if the shepherds weren't shocked enough, suddenly there was with The angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God. So this single angel, surrounded by the Shekinah glory of God, is now accompanied by thousands and thousands of angels. And they're all doing the same thing. They're all declaring the praises of God to these few lowly shepherds. Look at verse 14. Look at what they're saying. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest, they cry out, and on earth peace among those with whom he, God, is pleased. Glory to God in the highest places. It's the highest heavens. It's not the highest degree. We sing that we think it's as much as we can praise him. That's not bad, but that's not what it's saying. It's saying glory to God in the highest realms, in the highest heavens. Now you say, well, wait, isn't glory always being given to God in the heavens? Well, of course, but this is glory for a new initiative. This is the angel singing glory to God for the work he's doing in Christ. This is glory being given to God in that moment for two things. One, Christ becoming a man, and two, Christ initiating the war on sin. And so they are singing glory to God in the highest in the heavenly places. The long-awaited work of the Messiah had begun, and everybody's rejoicing. 
The angels are rejoicing. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are rejoicing. I dare say we could have heard the rocks crying out, rejoicing and praising God because the Savior had finally come to overcome the burden of sin that even creation suffers from. But this praise was not just the result of the incarnate Christ. It was praise for what he was going to do. It was praise foreshadowing his work on the cross. Verse 14 again. Glory to God in the highest places and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Praise to God because Christ is going to bring peace to man. Peace between God and man. An end to the war. An end to the war. Again, this peace is not the subjective peace. It can produce that. It is the Old Testament peace. It is shalom. You've heard this dozens of times from this pulpit. Not peace based upon your circumstances. Yesterday I had peace. Today I have no peace. This is the whole social order of well-being prosperity, security, and harmony between God and man and man in creation. It is a consummate expression of how it was before the fall between God and man and creation. After rebuking Simon the Pharisee, same house, same scenario, for his misunderstanding of the gospel, calling this prostitute a sinner and unworthy of God, Jesus then said to the prostitute, this is amazing, listen, He said, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. One chapter later in Luke chapter 8, if you remember, Jesus is surrounded by the crowd and the hemorrhaging woman wants to just get up and she wants to touch him. Her faith is so powerful. She believes that she can just touch his garment. She'll be healed. She does. She is. Christ wants to know who touched her. She confesses and then Jesus says to her in Luke 8, 48, daughter, I love that, daughter, your faith has made you well. What? Go in peace. Go in peace. This peace is the fruit of the incarnation. It began with Jesus coming in the flesh and it was completed when he ascended the cross and sacrificed his body and his blood to redeem sinners like us. Peace among those with whom God is pleased. Peace, not war. Peace, not hostility. Peace, not condemnation. So the question is, and you've probably been waiting for this, is who is God pleased with? Because that's what it says here. Peace to those with whom God is pleased. Now for those of you raised on the theology of Charlie Brown as I was, You know the King James version of that. My first introduction to the gospel story came through Charlie Brown. And the King James reads, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And some of the transcripts, some of the extent manuscripts actually say that. Some of the more accurate manuscripts actually give us the render we have here in the ESV, that it's peace with whom he is pleased. Now, as Westerners, when we hear about peace and joy, we immediately make it about ourselves, right? We say, well, I had joy this Christmas. There was food, there was family, there were presents. And I had peace because I woke up and I didn't feel all that bad. But the joy in this passage we've already seen is the joy of the gospel being made available to all. And the peace that God is talking about here is not the peace you get on your Christmas card. It's the peace between God and man. It's an end to the war initiated by Jesus Christ. So the consummate question, I believe, for you this Christmas season is, is God pleased with you? Right? There's peace is given to those with whom he is pleased. So the question is, is God pleased with you? Now, the flesh immediately goes to the wrong place. We immediately become Pharisees. Because when I ask that question, the thought is, oh, have I been good? I mean, is God pleased with me? I, I think, have I, have I lived a good life Was this year a good year? And we begin to stack up all the good and the bad and we create a moral boundary. And then we say, yes, God is pleased or not pleased. The shepherds would not have answered like that. Remember, the shepherds were not the type of people you'd want your daughter to marry. And so they would say, of course not. I'm not pleasing to God. I'm a shepherd. But more importantly, they would have grown up singing Psalm 147. Listen. 
Psalm 147 gives us the answer to who God is pleased with. God's delight is not in the strength of the horse nor his pleasure in the legs of man. God does not take pleasure in your strength, your good works, your morality, or your religion. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. You want to know if God has taken pleasure in you in Christ? Ask yourself what the psalmist just said. Do you have a right reverential fear of God? Do you understand the holiness of God and the sacrifice of Christ to redeem us from the pit of hell? Or do you strive daily to find perfection on your own merit? Have you placed your hope? It's a simple question, my beloved. Your whole life, past, present, present and future, in the steadfast love of God as revealed in the incarnate Son. Have you? The Son entered the world in a new way. He took on a body because our bodies are subject to death as a result of sin. So Christ took on that body and surrendered his body to death in our place as a what? As a pleasing sacrifice to the Father. Isaiah 53, verse 10, the Lord was pleased to crush Jesus and cause him to suffer and make his life an offering for sin for us. So the Father sent the Son, and the Son suffered and died in our place. And they both did this out of their steadfast love for his people. There is no greater love than this, my beloved. There is no greater way for you to please God than to rejoice and live in the steadfast love of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as revealed in Christ and then live a holy life. That's what you're called to. So we see the recipients of the gospel of peace, those who know that they cannot end the war themselves but put all their hope in Christ the Lord. We've seen the glory of the gospel and why the angels descended singing that the Son of God has become a man and he has brought an end making peace by making war on the cross. One more, if you're still with me, I pray you are. What are the effects of all this? What should the impact be upon you? After you finish your Christmas dinner and you open up all the presents, what should be your meditation on December 25th that night? I pray this was it. Look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, they didn't just vanish, they actually ascended into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They want to verify the message. Verse 16, and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. Verse 18, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Verse 19, but Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in the heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. So the angels ascend back into heaven, and without hesitation, the shepherd says, we got to go see if this is true. And so they go to Bethlehem. And sure enough, they find Mary and Joseph and a baby in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, and it is Jesus. And then as soon as this is validated to them, look at what they do. It says they make known to everyone present their experience with the angels. But not just the manifestation, which would have been certainly worth talking about, right? Oh, by the way, tens of thousands of angels descended to the Shekinah glory of God and talked to us tonight. They focused on the message. They focused on what the angels said, that the baby lying in the manger is in fact the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior, Christ the Lord. That's what they shared. Everyone present, when they heard this, it says they were amazed. Better translation, it says they wondered. Better translation is they were amazed, literally amazed at what they heard. Mary heard it, Now remember, she had already had Gabriel speak to her in Luke 1, and she had Elizabeth give the prophecy in Luke 1. And so this is additional revelation, and we're told that she took it, and she treasured it in her heart. That that literally means to protect and to guard these revelations. 
She treasured them and then she pondered them. She thought about them deeply. My beloved, I, I want you to hear the message of the Son of God becoming a man today during this Christmas season. And I want you, like all those present at the birth of Christ, I want you to be utterly amazed. I do. I want this to be a breathtaking truth for you so that every time you think about it, you go, oh, wow, wow, every single time. I want you to hear how God the Father made peace with man by sending his son into the world to die for our sins. And like Mary, I want you to hold on to these truths, guard them with all your might, ponder them in your heart, meditate on them deeply. They will encourage you each and every day. But the response that I pray each and every one of us would have, including myself, the response I pray that God would grant to us this morning is that we would respond like the shepherds. Look at verse 20 again, in case you missed it. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. What a remarkable turn of events for these lowly outcasts in the first century. Of no doing of their own, God was pleased to manifest his glory to them on that historic night and reveal the gospel of Jesus Christ. Upon hearing God's word, they go to Bethlehem with haste, just as they were told, to see the Christ child, and they what? They believed. And they believed. Unable to hold their tongues at this great revelation, we're told they testify loud and wide to everyone present. No fear of man there. They told everyone there that Jesus is the Savior, Christ the Lord. And then once the encounter is complete, they leave the presence of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. They return to their flocks, utterly changed men doing what? Look at it again, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Do you see what happened, my beloved, in this exchange of glory? The glory that had been proclaimed by the angels in the highest heavens had been brought down to earth, and now it was being replicated by these first century evangelists. The glory of heaven was now upon the hearts and minds of these shepherds and they were praising and glorifying God for all they had heard and all they had seen. The shepherds heard the word of God, they believed in the Savior, they testified with their mouths the gospel of grace and then they worshiped God as changed men. That's what I want for you, that's what I want for myself. This is the right response to the Christmas story. So I ask you, is this not the response you want in your own heart? Is this not the response you want in your mission field? To hear the word of God, believe in the Savior, testify to the gospel, and worship God. It's not only the right response. I'll go so far as to say it's the only response. It's the only response to the Christmas story. If you hear it in any other way as something that reminds you of sweet childhood memories as scenes played throughout church history of nativities, festivities. If you receive this in any other way than the Son of God coming to declare war upon sin that you, a sinner, might be saved, you're not receiving it correctly and therefore you won't respond correctly. As we close, I want you to ask yourselves sincerely, how well do you hear the truth of God's word and how well are you living it out this Christmas season? How well are you hearing it? Is the word of God close to your heart? Are you pondering it? Is it shaping you today, tomorrow? If not, I would argue you're probably missing peace in your life. How well are you believing? Really believing that God has made peace with you through the shed blood of his son. And therefore, there's nothing more for you to do, saint of God. How well are you believing that? Or are you still seeking peace by trying to be a good little Christian? Are you like the shepherds, so overwhelmed by the the good news of great joy that you cannot 
keep your mouth closed? That when the whole world stops to celebrate a day we call Christmas, you overflow with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do your families know? Do your friends know? Do your neighbors? Do they know the good news of great joy? What is the disposition of your heart? Glorifying and praising God for all you have heard and seen. And if you know Christ, oh, what you have heard and what you have seen in your own life. You don't have to be there on that night. There's ample movement by the Spirit of God in your life to testify to these eternal truths today, tomorrow, and every day until Christ comes in glory or brings you home. Are you glorifying and praising God in your heart because you know, I mean, you really know that you are completely undeserving of the grace. You really know the sacrifice that was made for Christ, the Son of God, dying for your sins. My beloved, if you know that you have been forgiven much, you will love much. It will be the litmus test for you. I pray that the members of Cambrian Park Baptist Church will love God, love one another, and love this lost world. Why? Because, listen, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. What a message we have, my beloved. Let's make sure we share it with everyone that is willing to hear. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you executed Operation Christ the Lord. You sent him into this world to declare war upon sin and death that your people might be bought back, made into a new race, a holy priesthood for your glory. We are so thankful, Lord, that this mission was a complete and perfect success, that upon the cross, Christ cried out, it is finished because it is And because the work has been done through repentance and through faith, we can come in and we can have peace with you right now. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would grant us that, that we would know that we are at peace with you, our Father, through the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And being at peace, Father, we would no longer strive to make ourselves right before you, but knowing our eternal righteousness given to us freely by Christ, we would live in that peace striving, pursuing, loving, ministering, serving, and even dying if necessary because we are right now at peace with you. Father, I pray that you would bless my brothers and sisters here, that you would grant us that deep and profound understanding. Strike the Pharisees out of our hearts, Father. Draw us in like children and shepherds that we can see that we are not worthy, but you make us worthy in Jesus. And then in that state, Lord, encourage us. Encourage us as a people to go, to testify, to love as you've equipped us to do in your spirit. I ask that you would do it for for your church that we might experience the blessings that come from such beautiful gospel obedience. And I ask that you would do it for this community that we might be a brilliant light here in this most dark place. But above all else, I ask you would do it for your own glory that you might be glorified in our response to this great news of Christ coming as a man. I praise you for this passage and the proclamation of this gospel. I ask that by your spirit you would apply it to our hearts and minds, that we might be utterly changed. In Jesus' name, amen.